first thing really for me was Henry's Dream because that was the first record that I really actually paid attention to and actually heard. I was of the age finally to, I think, understand Nick Cave and understand his music. Where before that, The Good Son was one where I had heard about and had heard a little bit from, but it seemed a little over my head. And I think I was still too young to really be able to fully apprehend it and see what it was and where it was coming from. And Henry's Dream was something that was very powerful to me because it got a lot more raw. It's when they started to get that, you know, that real thick density to a lot of stuff that the uh, the first couple of records didn't have so much. They were a lot more sparse and angular and... Uh... They seemed to be a bit more of a top indie band, like pretty much like the birthday party were with Junkyard. It was a very top indie album. And uh, when uh, Martin joined, they seemed to get a new appreciation for the bottom end. I used to play in a group called the Triffids and uh, we used to uh, tour Europe um, doing a lot of festivals and stuff and uh, we'd often cross paths with the Bad Seeds. He's just a solid pulsing bedrock and it's just like he's, he's consistent. He was uh, probably the person who made the Triffids a great band because I've, I'd seen them before he joined and... Uh, it was just amazing the difference he made to them joining too. Uh, and the Triffids sort of ground to a halt. Um, and, uh, and then I got a call from Mick Harvey who uh, asked me if I wanted to play bass for them. He knew, knew that I was at a loose end and uh, he'd, uh, they'd just done The Good Son and uh, Mick Harvey wanted to play guitar and vibraphone and organ, basically as many instruments as he can play. Henry's dream is just this like immense cavalcade of sound. I like the way it sounds. I feel bad saying that on camera because it's my understanding that the band themselves do not like the way it sounds. And so I don't want to sound like, you know, the guy who doesn't get it and doesn't know what it was supposed to sound like, you know, but to me, that record swells. It really, it really, it has a fierceness of attack. I've read in a lot of interviews that he didn't like the uh, the production on the album. That he had this producer, David Briggs, who um, had produced a lot of Neil Young's records, and he got him because he was Neil Young's producer, and he didn't like the sound that he was producing. And then. Um, Later on, I interviewed uh, Jennifer from Royal Trucks, and she was saying that, that they, they loved that uh, Henry's Dream album, and that was the whole reason they used David Briggs as a producer, was because they loved the production on the, on the album. And they were telling me that he used to wear a, David Briggs used to wear a, a shark skin suit and would just dance in the studio. And that, his, his method of production was just to dance, and then if he stopped, he called himself the vibologist, and uh, he would stop dancing if he didn't like the music. And that was the only way they would know whether or not to, to stop playing, was they'd look out in the window and see him dancing. And I often wondered whether Nick Cave had a similar experience. I said it was a disaster actually. I, says, I don't know why. Why David Briggs was a famous guy and he made cool recordings with uh, Neil Young, I think. If you ask me, altogether I think it was absolutely unnecessary. That guy did not have more expertise than this band combined. That band, I think the Bad Seeds were very much capable of knowing what they were doing. And uh, maybe that is different now or with Nick Lonnie, but uh, at that point we, we were quite, we knew what we were doing. It's the only record that's been produced by a name producer. Um, and there was a, quite a lot of shopping around. I think there were a couple of meetings with possible producers. I took part in one of them, which was the... Um, uh, I forgot his name. He produced several Rolling Stones records. He produced. Um, he he is infamous for having invented the the cowbell riff for Honky Tonk Woman, and it, I think he produced Primal Scream after that. I forgot his name. He looked like Buffalo Bill, and we had a, we had a meeting with him, and then I believe there were some other meetings with other producers. It was it was done. Um, as an experiment, I think, to work with someone else and see what would happen. Obviously, a failed experiment. I understand the, the logic behind it, but not having met Briggs, but, you know, having read Shaky and heard various stories, it would have been uh, something that I'd like to have witnessed just purely on the basis of the nature of the way people record, and I would have thought it, it, it would have worked out well. Initially, they were meant to record it in Woodstock, you know, in Bearsville, which is a, a place near Woodstock. 
Um, and um, they all went over there to commence recording and the producer didn't turn up. We did some really good stuff there, but um, everything got delayed and we ended up recording in Los Angeles instead. Some of the original material that was recorded in Bearsville in, uh, in, uh, in a really nice studio, much better studio than what David Briggs had there, is to my, to my, to my, in my memory at least, sounding much better than the actual record. I make records and I know that the process of making an album can poison a song you expected to fully love, you know, and that, that you'll never be able to recover if you, if the experience, if you have a bad experience in recording, you know, no matter what anybody has to say about the record later, you yourself will remember that, you know, personality clashes or, or just not getting the sound that you had hoped and it's hard than to look at that from outside. He had headphones on while recording, and if some sudden feedback happens, he would go, oh, oh, that almost killed me. And he would probably inhale the rest of his spliff. Uh, I don't know, that was not so... Um, um, played the song 20 times. The producer just listened the ba the the backing tracks very loud, very loud, and said always it's fantastic and great and great and great. Uh, apparently, it did work out fairly well until David was given the album to mix, and the mix that he eventually ended up with is not a patch on what was apparently laid down in the studio. This was a band that wasn't going to allow a producer to um, present them with a vision. That, you know, the producer was somebody who had to work with them. So the sorts of people they'd used up to that time, like Tony Cohen, were basically working for them and not sort of so much instructing them. It was far more of a collaborative process. I think that's the first and last time we've used a producer as such. I think they had to remix the whole record, except one song. Nick and Mick had sort of borrowed the master tapes from the American recording studio. They went into the studio and uh, they, Tony Cohen put it on the drills and they, they just found out that Tony was going, this is not a cool recording. And I can remember one day he was horrified, Mick and Nick were both horrified that the American recording studio had actually rung their mothers demanding to know where these master tapes were. And they basically said that you can do anything to us, but don't hassle our mums. Well, the, the interesting thing to me about Henry's Dream is that it's an album that I, I really like. I really like the whole album. And Papa Won't Leave you, Henry seems a great start to it. And the idea that he wrote this song, for he sent some interviews that he wrote this song for his son. And it seems to be really powerful, really, really great opening to an album. One of the best openings to a Nick Cave album that there is, I think. And when I became a father myself, um, it, it, that song kind of immediately had a new meaning for me. I saw it was 1992 in my... Wife had just been diagnosed as uh, having MS, and she and well, no, she's diagnosed a bit before that, but she's pregnant with our son or son to be, and that's when um, Henry's Dream came out, and I just that album has got so many tracks on it that kind of I can relate to. Suddenly, I sort of saw that song um, in a different way again because it, I related it, you know, to to the whole notion of parenthood and the, you know, the, um, the, you know, the the nervousness and the excitement of it when you sort of become a parent for the first time. He was born. Uh, I suppose that re that record must have come out in March or something like that. I think he was born in September, and so he wasn't named directly after it, but. Uh, the name, I suppose, was just knocking around, really. And uh, we still listen to it now, and it's... Uh, no, he's 15, and I'd say, oh, Papa won't leave you, Henry. And he's still, it's still kind of... Not our song, exactly, but it still means a lot to me. And I... Well, I don't know if it means anything to him at the moment, but maybe it will do when he's a bit older again, I think. When he was younger, it meant a lot to him. And I think he'll come to appreciate it when he stopped listening to, listening to death metal as well, I think. But I have to say that rambling long sentence style that he used to do that he does a little more now, but for a few years, starting with, uh, I think, around the Boatman's Call, he wasn't really working as, as much in that vein. But that, that very long, involved, multi-adjectival phrase sentence sort of style that he worked in for a long time, uh, Papa Don't Leave You Henry is like the apex of that style. There seemed to be so many words in it. Um, it was words images, incantations, all these, uh, all these things piled on top of one another, seemingly fired out from a gun. And the band 
like a locomotive underneath, just just pummeling away as the, as these words kept flying out, and it 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 felt just like a, a a cascade of ideas. It's my iPod song of choice when I'm going on a long walk or a run. I put on Leave Your Henry. Uh, it just gets you pumping. Um, slow build and then it's whoa, into it um i just uh, the, the lyrics are fantastic um i love you know it's into the guilt it's into the shame and it's into the fucking fry the lines in that are, are just unbelievable you know the the arm being you know ripped the flesh being ripped off the arm to the bone and stuff and the you know the fag and whalebone corset all that stuff is just like you can just see it like in front of you like it's a it's a movie playing uh, as you hear the song the music of the pace the music of the song is fantastic but the ability he has to tell a story and to get that out that whole album is about telling stories to me and i immediately i'm listening to it and i had to get the lyric sheet out this is papa won't leave you henry and it's as you can see it's a very long song it kind of just goes on and on and on. From beginning to end, this is a tour de force. It ends on such a nice strong note. It really has such a sound structure. And it's somewhere around here where Michelle is rolled in linoleum and shot in the neck. And then down here is the fag in a whalebone corset. It's a song I can uh, unfortunately kind of relate to because uh, once when I was younger, um, I passed out at a frat party and I woke up with a football player's dick draped across my cheek. It's not quite a fag in a whalebone corset, but it's, you know, it's pretty close. So that's kind of, I got that, uh, that thing that I can relate to in that song, which is actually something I try to put behind me. I don't know why I keep playing that record to tell you the truth. Here, somewhere near the end is the babies being born without brains. You know, he's, he's listing off all the bad things happening at some point, and it's babies being born without brains. This is some classic Nick Cave. I feel like Henry's dream is like the point where he really reached a new ability with his lyrics to find this sense of making sense of the soul and making sense of humanity. I think Nick has slowly but surely been opening the, the doors. I mean... He's he's hidden behind characters or situations within uh, within songs to kind of explain things about you know his world and about him. The sequencing of the music is so essential towards understanding what each song is about. The, the uh, straight to you. The, the 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 menace and doom about it isn't just in the song itself. It's in the songs that surround it. What is it? I, I have I had a dream, Joe, and uh, I don't remember what's on the other side of it. Uh, but the way that there's it's, it's these these death songs surrounding it that all of a sudden the love song sounds so out of place and so bizarre. But you list, start listening to it more carefully, and even though the music is this kind of almost mirthful, happy tune, at least for Nick Cave, there's there's still something that that keeps it coming along it's it's like the other songs have bled into it and have distorted it and and have have demonized it yeah straight to you is is it's that song that i always listen to yeah when a, when the relationship's just gone down the pan um when it's yeah when it's fucked when it's got not 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 because I, I it's it just fuck, you know. I mean, it just fuck. Other relationships do. They just fuck up, and that's the the song that. Because I love that. I I don't love it, but it, no, I do love it. I love that whole melancholic feeling that, that you get when you're listening to a song when you're down, and it, it's and that's the song that I always listen to, and it does that. But then it just takes you right back up again, and makes you feel great, and makes you feel that you're not going to fuck it up again. I find that it's a very uplifting song, even though you could interpret the lyrics as mainly negative. Um, I think that the narrator is saying that no matter what happens in life, no matter how many bad things come your way, you know, he always has that one person to go to. It's just that all-consuming, you know, you feel when you're falling in love that you're, you know, you could die or it could 
totally consume you and you know there's a there's a fear and a and a um there's a you know that the the pain of too much tenderness because you do you know really um immerse yourself in these feelings and and straight to you is where he feels like that and and you know it kind of you know i i can understand how that feels there's not many songs for me that take you straight up and down through those two emotions perfectly and straight to you just does it perfectly to the brink of tears to i say brink because i'm a man so obviously i don't cry um to the elation that it's gonna be all right next relationship will be fine and next relationship will be more careful and um do a bit of uh, research before getting involved my wife uh, was pregnant at the time and she was actually due that day we were shooting that video and uh, my nerves got the better of me and uh, uh, it was a long day shooting that video and uh, it was quite good fun but I think we all got, I mean I did, I certainly got carried, a bit carried away and was a bit worse for wear by the end of the day. And luckily, um, my daughter was born the next day when I was in, uh, yeah. There was two, two incidents I remember when, um, I first started working at Mute and my favorite, which still makes me laugh inside every time was Henry's dream when, um, Seth was working and he got all the lyrics transcribed and he was sorting out the um the artwork and every single place where stars appears on that album um and it appears a lot it, um they'd put stairs in instead of stars so um is it swinging from the stairs and i remember seth reading it out to nick on the phone and he hadn't realized he just you know when you're just reading something and um you know actually sort of understanding it you're just reading it and he was like i think nick was i don't know if nick was in brazil or whatever but reading it out to him. and i was sitting opposite him and he was just reading nick on the phone reading it out to him i could just hear him saying swinging from the stairs to nick and then just suddenly seth pulling the phone away from his head and obviously nick had taken exception to uh seth suggesting that he'd written swinging from the stairs as opposed to swinging from the stars. What was really great about this record is the majority of that material was recorded together as a band, one take classical way, all of them playing together, which is something that I cherish a lot. And um, yeah, especially Christina, the astonishing the version, the original Burstwell, Burstwell version is really good. There's a book that he mentioned about it's it's a book about all the saints. I forget the name of it, but it and that's how I think he um that's how that's when he wrote Christina the Astonishing. I think it's Logend Logenda Legenda Aurea, the Golden Legend, one of the most popular books in medieval times, which is just uh, the life of the saints. Nick Cave has definitely gotten me interested in in saints and like their craziness. So you'll get a song like Christina the Astonishing. I hear that song and I think about Christina for hours. And I remember the reason probably why I like it so much is because when I was younger, when I was really little, my grandfather would tell me these ghost stories and these tragic love ballads about death. And so I think that's why I like the song so much because like it has that haunting, It's it has this like haunting beauty about it. It really got me interested in when I went to Cyprus, which is where my family is from, I decided I would go and visit all of these churches with all of the relics from the saints. And I actually did see the skull of Lazarus over there. These are like epic narratives. You know, Nick is a great writer and storyteller. He took fables and stories and things that really were started in the idea of murder ballads and and 1920s 1930s folk music and a lot of that mostly which came from america and then just stylized it in a way with 
when I first came to town, Nick Cave used the old tradition of folk songwriting where a song gets passed on from one singer to the next it's you know it's based it's based on a traditional song but um but the twists that or the twist is maybe a bit too grand a term that nick brings to it is is are amazingly effective karen dalton did a version i think uh, katie cruel she called it and that's when it first introduced me to um karen dalton who you know it's hard work getting her records and easy to get them now but very hard then to find them and uh but i managed to track them down and they're just you know two of her records well the two she did are absolutely fantastic still sell them in the shop now and still sound great as well this is a particularly beautiful song with a violin play fiddling and karen dalton singing with her broken voice about herself or someone coming to a town and at first this person is welcomed and um, but after a while this person gets thrown literally thrown out of town he took the american gothic idea and just reinterpreted it as someone from australia and australia being looking like the wild west but looking like a mind-blown version of the Wild West, looking like some abstract, expanded, monolithic element of the West all spread out amongst a larger country. It's just so amazing to see that he takes things that were made here in a smaller place, in a more constrained place, and then just reinterprets it as someone from there. This album, you know, it just reminded me of some of my favorite touchstones. For instance, the film Night of the Hunter. You know, Night of the Hunter. Some of the songs on Henry's Dream could be soundtracks to accompany Robert Mitchum in Night of the Hunter. If you know that film, it's a great, almost American expressionist film. What it really makes me think of is Sergio Leone films, the Westerns, and about how he took the idea of the Western as a cultural and a genre and then just made it into this giant piece of art in a much different way. It's like reading a book. Listening to his music is like reading a book or watching a film, particularly watching a film because the images that he brings up, the images that he can evoke is just startling. A song like John Finn's Wife, which was basically, I guess, about you know a brawl in a bar over you know a lustful men looking at another man's wife. And I mean, it just it really, they're, they're quite, you know, brilliant. And they work almost as miniature short stories, as songs, you know, the vignettes, very cinematic. I'd like to see a music video made for that. I don't think it was done. Sometimes uh, when I hear a song that means a lot to me or, you know, just has something about it, I tend to imagine what the video would be like if I were to direct it. I almost felt that I was there. And I think that's why I felt that, that real palpable feeling uh, when I was listening to it, because I almost felt like I, I could have been in that room. You know, we've got this nighttime scene, uh, celebration of John Finn's wedding. Uh, the band is playing, which of course it's the Bad Seeds. After one performance, I, I decided that I'd sort of catch up with Nick to show him some of my photographs. So I um, went down to um, a recording studio in Melbourne and with my wife, Mary, and showed Nick these photographs and gave him some of them. And he was generous enough to sort of ask if we wanted to come back and have a look at what they were doing. And so we went, we went um, into the recording studio and Mick and uh, Nick were sort of sitting there and they were uh, remixing uh, John Finn's wife. John Finn's wife is played by me. <laughs> um, so in my entrance, um, you know, it's a flurry of black and red fabric and it's very cinematic in my head, of course. And I think that's what Nick Cave does. He really draws you into the story and, and you almost become one of the characters. And eventually they sort of decided that it was finished and they played it from beginning to end with that incredible refrain at the end. It was just, to hear that song was just amazing for the first time. And Nick sort of turned around and said, so what did you think of that? And I went, that was fucking brilliant. And Nick said, you can stay. I particularly like an unpopular song off that, and um, uh, which is Loom of the Land. It was the dirty, end, end, the dirty End of Winter. I mean, what a, what a tremendous concept, because we know how dirty 
winters are. Um, uh, and this, the sense that he's walking along the rum, uh, near the rumbling station uh, with his hands in po possibly in the pockets of his loved one and breathing milky white air from deep in her throat. There's no need to quote the lyrics because it's really the feeling um, and, and that's the word loom. It's a very useful indicator of what's good about that song. It has a sort of an imminent emotion um, to it that, that, you know, that you don't really get from quoting the wind it bit bitter. I mean, there's a sort of... Uh, incidental pleasure in the in, in the bit bitter um, linguistic thing, but it doesn't really give you the, f uh, or it doesn't really give me the feeling that I get from that record, which I really, that track, which I really love. It's quite an amazing feeling. And I think that, yeah, music and lyrics together is a, there's a strange formula with Nick Cave. It's kind of a masterclass in just simple storytelling evocative it's not overdone it's not heavily framed it's it's just a an immaculate steinbeckian story with the little details that just give you enough that with a small intake of breath you're there on this this promontory wherever they can see the lie of the land and the knife in his jeans and the his hand on her breast are such small details but it's nick getting the it exactly right with real finesse and simplicity. Always underlying it, a sense of stripped backness or, or sparseness um, of, ex of one of those existential moments where uh, you're with someone um, uh, almost, in, in, almost fatally in love. If you're not careful, you can start to feel hollowed out. It's, uh, it's a strange feeling. Nick Cave often talks about um, Lorca, the Spanish poet, and uh, Duende, which is that... I don't know, I think Cave put it as um, the dark sound or dark sounds and, and Lorca talks about these dark sounds as being sort of a, a throbbing earth sound or uh, getting in touch with something that's so primal inside all of us that philosophers can't really explain. Um, and that, that duende, I think, really holds true in Loom of the Land. I, I think he's, he's captured something that is... Um, so fundamental to all of us. It's um, made me feel so much about this particular man who, you know, Nick Cave, think, oh, my God, he's he's got this brutal swagger about him and he's got balls and he's got everything, but he um, can write women so well. And The Loom of the Land is literally a song that makes me it makes my womb quiver like it's just so sensual and so beautiful there's there's great love there but there's also great tragedy and and that's what makes his music and his, particularly his love songs so successful in 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 the way i read them he just writes women so well he he gets that femininity he he understands it he um in his lyrics, you can just feel it. I see a lot of um, understanding and compassion and, and love and anger and, in the songs and um, they were particularly written for me. And, and yeah, I, I, I feel, yeah, honoured, yeah. It's, um, certain things are very accurate. Very, very accurate and, and very, very beautiful. Even in Jack the Ripper. <laughs> there have been a few versions of Jack the Ripper. There was Screaming Lord Such, uh, Hands Off the Ripper. And uh, LL Cool J did a version of Jack the Ripper. I mean, Jack the Ripper, Spring Hill Jack, is a central figure in... Uh, <laughs> You know, the darkest, uh, you know, the deepest myth, po mythopoetic uh, archetypes, probably, uh, that, uh, you know, one is instilled with, you know, from an early age when parents try and frighten you. So to write a song based on Jack and to sing it as effectively with such a tortured vocal as Nick brought to that recording, you know, I just really admire the uh the sensibility of play there i can also relate to jack the ripper because there's you know many a time when i've tried to show uh 
people affection, say like uh, some f wives of friends of mine, and they kind of take it the wrong way. And I'm not quite sure, you know, it was just a little friendly tongue down the throat and they act like it's a really big deal. And I'm just trying to say, you know, hey, I really care about you. I love you. I love your husband. Um, and they just overreact. That's Nick at his worst, Jack the Ripper. It's just a fucking dirge. It's like, I mean, you know, if you're going to do stuff like that, do heavy metal. I think Nick should have done some heavy metal, you know. It's the only genre he's not done, I mean, isn't it, really? It's a, just an absolute cacophony. I can't bear it. I, it's really teenage. I mean, it's mighty fine coming from me. I mean, artists are very easy to get on with if you're fond of children. But... I don't think things like that have stood the te test of time at all. I just think it's an unholy racket. Everybody, when they listen to music, has certain periods where that music really connects with you. And the period for me was probably in the time between 1990 and 1993 or 94. Uh, 92, I think it was. And it was, um, it was Reading Festival. And um, I'd gone specifically like a lot of people to go and see Nirvana and they were like second to the top headlining if memory serves me well and yeah I just remember I didn't know anything about them I didn't know anything about the, the music or even what the, to expect um I just knew there was this band on that was second to the top that I had no idea what they were going to sound like and yeah it blew me away and totally changed it was like a real big turning point in in my taste in music probably scaring the bejesus out of most of the young indie rockers out there is like this is this is definitely something that i need to know more about yeah it was quite mind-blowing i didn't really know what to make of it because you know the, it had an entire day of kind of plaid shirt wearing indie grungy music and then on come a load of blokes in suits uh doing stuff that was just a million miles away from everybody else that day so I mean, they really stuck out. When you see them really clicking on stage, you see the joy in playing. It's these five, six, seven musicians that obviously love each other playing within an inch of their life. And if you can't see that as a fan, then you're not seeing the show. What's interesting about going to see Nick in different countries is the reaction of the audience. They're very different in, in different countries. So I hadn't really experienced, I guess, Italian culture or behavior before. That was an incredible experience because the Italian concert is so different than other cities. The lights went down and the theme music to Once Upon a Time on the West uh, came up over the speaker system. And of course, being an Italian composer, um, the Milanese people thought, oh, this is, this is fantastic. And I thought, oh, I love this film. I love this music. And there was just this electric atmosphere and it sort of went on for a couple of minutes. I thought, oh, this is, this is beautiful. Uh, the band strode on, Nick strode on up to the microphone and launched into Papa Won't Leave You, Henry. And, and I kind of had to, to grip something because <laughs> the whole crowd just, just went up and down with the music. And it was quite well, almost terrifying that this huge crowd was just going up and down with the music. The light bulbs were flashing. The band were absolutely tearing into this version of Papa Won't Leave You, Henry. It was, it was one of the greatest things I'd ever seen and will always remember that night in Milan. Henry's dream, if I'm just going to like mindlessly throw on a Nick Cave record, is usually the one that I put on. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's because we toured with them in Australia on the big day out right around that time. Um, but I think it also has to do with just like the songs being really, really great. There's this very interesting part of the way that, that he puts his records together that he can and he's allowed to and everybody accepts the fact that a Nick Cave record can be anything that Nick wants it to be, but it's always undoubtedly a Nick Cave record. It's really a record for me also that that worked as a record. I feel like that was very instrumental in teaching me how how an album can run, how an album can go through different emotional highs and lows. and I mean, I really think that, you know, you have a low point with with uh, uh, Straight to You as far as uh, an emotional low. But then, you know, by the end of the album, you, know, you have Jack the Ripper, which is just ending with this, the most 
brutal song on the record, the most intense song on the record, and just just the, the way that the acoustic guitar is just like slamming down the chord, and 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 the drums are just almost like a, a militant drum beat just rolling along, and and it's it's such an incredible way to end a record because usually you're used to the conclusion, and there's an outro, and there's a slow letdown that occurs, but he ends it on such a high. It's like almost like an encore <laughs> on the record. And I really, listening to that record over and over again, I really felt like you can pick up on the logic of why this song was put here, why that song was put there, what the rhythm is and how it worked. And and it's just so beautiful how I think that all fits together. And that I don't think that he had done that on any of his albums before. I really think that record, there's something they didn't do before or again. You know, it has its own thing, which I think to them means they didn't get what they wanted. But what they got instead is unique in the catalog. And so I think that's pretty great. Star spangled and the coins in my pocket go jingle. 